Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Munich, and I welcome you at uh, the building of CERCI, uh, Joint Academic Workplace of the Academy of Science and uh, of uh, Charles University. Uh, I'm glad you found time and interest to um, attend this uh, public uh, seminar. Uh, and I'm glad I see so many important people who definitely will influence the country in the next decades. Uh, and uh, I hope it that, uh, we'll be talking here about uh, will be useful for you. Uh, before I introduce our dear guest, uh, I will make a few uh, regular comments, uh, reminders. Uh, I already mentioned CERCI as academic, uh, joint academic workplace. Uh, I have to mention IDEA, uh, which is an academic think tank within CERCI, which is focusing on uh, say, policy-oriented research, contrary to the whole CERCI, which is focused much more on basic curiosity-driven research. And uh, I have to mention a strategy uh, of the Academy of Sciences for the 21st century, which is this poster, which is uh, supporting uh, this kind of events, not only public events, but also research related to policies today, uh, policies in the area of education and schooling. And uh, finally, uh, Professor Rifkin is uh, for several years involved in a very important research project of, of the Czech Grant Agency on, uh, on education and skills. So, this being said, uh, on introduction, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Rifkin. Uh, uh, he's from US. He works at uh, his uh, department head at the University of Illinois at Chica Chicago and got his PhD in California, Los Angeles in 91. And his primary uh, research focus is on, uh, on teachers, school teachers, and school principals, and related things. So from my perspective, he's a labor economist, empirical labor economist, because labor economists try to do many other things than just supply and demand. Uh, and uh, he published a number of very important influential papers on these topics with uh, several other important uh, scholars in the world. And among other, he, is, uh, he knows uh, quite something about uh, Central and Eastern Europe educational systems. He uh, visited Czech Republic several times in the past. Uh, and uh, so he spent uh, many hours talk, discussing and doing research uh, on what's going on here. Uh, so it should be said that uh, te teachers are being recognized as important element in education in the Czech Republic and the region for the last let's say, five, seven, eight, nine years. The general public seems to understand that teachers are probably important factor, uh, but what's being still neglected is the role of school principals, directors, ředitele, and. Uh, P Professor Rifkin is doing last uh, several years very important research on this uh, phenomena, empirical research. So, <coughs> naturally, we invited him to tell us about uh, his experience. Uh, he had a research seminar yesterday, so he went to very detailed technical issues. He will not tackle here today. But my overall uh, impression is that the topics, the questions, and sometimes the answers are the same, irrespective of whether we are in the US or whether we are here or in, in other countries in Europe. Simply, the general understanding and knowledge applies worldwide in the developed world. So, this being said, I will give floor to Steve, and uh, the program is that you have as much time as you want. <laughs> uh, it will be probably 45 minutes, 60 minutes. Sure. Uh, and there will be a round of uh, questions and answers and debate. And at the end, I shouldn't forget, there is some refreshment, either there or there or there. But we have to be patient. And floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's always very nice to come back here. Uh, my wife was born in Olomouc, and uh, so we had a kind of natural connection. Her father is from Prague and who went to Charles University and I think was working in the Czech Academy of Science too as, a, I guess, an electrical engineer when um, 
when they left in 1968 to move to the United States. So, you know, we have, we have a, it's a special place for me and I always enjoy coming. And not only just to enjoy visiting here, but it's, it's always great to be in the department at Suji I. Um, students are, are, are fascinating and doing great work and, and the faculty are always really good to talk to. So let me, um, let me begin. And I uh, titled this talk, you know, how do we raise the quality of school leadership? And so I think I'll stand up. Uh, and, and so I'm going to talk about school principles. Um, and it's interesting because this new focus on school principles um, I think comes out of this, the work on teachers uh, that, uh, that I was involved in for a long time and a lot of people have done a lot of uh, great research and I think more than that, I think some of the best research in social science kind of shows what people know to be true. You know, and then there's lots of arguments about it, but ultimately um, I think a lot of what has happened is that people have started to focus policy on things that parents and all of us who were in school, you know, at some point in our lives thought was the most important thing. So when I was young and my mother was a teacher and my aunt was a teacher for a long time, um, they would talk about school principles not very nicely often. That the school principal was often had been the gym teacher, the physical education teacher, was focused on um, the discipline of the children and wasn't someone who was the leader of the teachers or really what we call now an instructional leader who's one of whose jobs was to really create a kind of rich intellectual community for the teachers in order to not only work together but share knowledge with one another and make the school a more engaging um, and vibrant place. So what has happened I think all over but perhaps first in the US was this recognition that schools weren't some kind of machine you know, where you put some money in, you get a teacher who had some certain kind of certificate or license and went to a, a teacher training program, you have a class size, you get some curriculum, and you kind of, you know, it's like making vanuchka or something. You know, you, you put it all together and then it comes out as learning. And, you know, just like making delicious food, it's a lot, depends on the, you know, the qualities of the, the chef. I think that there was much greater recognition that what was really determining how um, well students learned and the quality of instruction were the skills of the teacher. And those skills weren't primarily you know, determined by which teacher training program you went to or how old you were after the first year or two of experience or your gender. You know, you, t you can think about taking two 35-year-old women, because most elementary school teachers are women, and, you, you know, same university, similar grades, everything about them is, is very similar observationally, and yet it's likely that they do very different jobs in terms of how effective they are as teachers, because people are very different. You know, people have different skills that they come to school with, come to life with, and then people learn differently and evolve differently. And so once once that's recognized, then the job of the principal becomes much more, much more important and complicated because the principal has to evaluate the teaching. The principal has to be there to either herself or to, you know, to use an assistant principal, usually herself, to mentor teachers, to provide feedback, and to try to shape the school to create opportunities for teachers to work together and not just sit and talk about teaching but do it in a productive way. Because one of the other things we've learned over time is that these large professional development programs in the US is like a big industry where school systems pay these companies millions of dollars to come and give seminars to their teaching staff or teachers go and take seminars. It doesn't seem to be very effective at all. And what it does, the evidence is pretty clear and I think isn't surprising that what seems to be effective is when someone observes you teaching,
talks to you about it, gives you detailed feedback, and provides some support to you on, on how to improve and the kinds of things that you can do. I mean, it's part of my job as a department head is to go in and observe it. I'm not, you know, I'm not well trained in that, and I'm not some great teacher, but there are fundamental things that you can, you know, you understand, right, with experience about um, <coughs> constantly assessing the knowledge of the students while you're teaching, you know, engaging them, making sure that the students feel safe and that the climate is, you know, a kind of rich climate for learning. And so I think that recognition, the kind of thing that all of us knew when we thought about how wonderful our fourth grade teacher was and maybe how not so wonderful our fifth grade teacher was, that's become more central to the way schools are operated and I think that's very promising. Okay. So the policy discussions in the U.S. Um, have focused on three areas. The first one is improving the preparation of principals and this has also been a focus of teachers and the preparation of teachers has changed a lot in the sense that now teacher training is much more clinically focused, more like the training of physicians <coughs> in that it's much more around giving teachers more opportunities to teach and observation and feedback and perhaps something similar will happen with principals. Though it's not clear how important and productive this has been for teachers. Um, strength and evaluation and incentives to raise school quality has been a very large part of what's happened in the U.S. and I think in, in countries all over the world. Um, and I'm going to talk about this. And um, it is the same as happened with schools and school principals. There has been some movement that I'm not going to talk about just to raise salaries you know, raise salaries just en masse. Um, that's been tried in some places. I think the challenge <coughs> is that one of the, the most important things that happens when you raise salaries is that you attract different people into the profession. So if you have a large salary increase, you know, that means that the current teachers who are already have been attracted to the profession at the lower salaries are going to get large raises which are going to be costly. Now for some of them they certainly deserve it, but I think if the focus is on you know, improving the quality of instruction, that's unlikely to have a big payoff. And so the movement in the U.S. has been to rethink how we determine salaries and to try to get a closer link in some, in some school districts and states have tried this between earnings and how effective someone is as a teacher. Okay. Um, and licensing requirements have been the third thing. This has been for teachers. Some people think we should make it more um, challenging to become a teacher, that you should have to get a master's degree and finish more specific courses. But I think uh, uh, more people, and I'm one of them, have thought that what we really want to do is open up teaching to more people. So if people have a college degree, perhaps in science or mathematics, where we have shortages of teachers, even if they haven't gone to pedagogy school, that they can take courses while they begin teaching and get some, you know, some other training in that way. And in fact, some of those programs have been quite promising. So I'm gonna briefly kind of summarize in a non-technical way some of what I spoke about yesterday, which is evidence about the effects of principles um, on the quality of instruction and that by the quality of instruction I really mean more broadly when we talk about measuring um, educator effectiveness now we don't do so by looking at their their characteristics you know how how much schooling they have whether they went to a prestige more prestigious university we try to we try to look at the effects of those educators on how much students learn or the kinds of skills they develop. And I think there's been extensive discussion now in the United States that it's not just enough to look at test scores. And so in this work, we look not only at test scores, there's a couple of different papers. One looks only at test scores and the other one looks at longer term outcomes and behavioral measures um, to, to look at a, you know, a broader, more inclusive set of skills uh, because things like longer term educational attainment, employment, how you progress in the workforce, and social outcomes. Um, there's a growing body of evidence 
that, that these kinds of behavioral skills, economists call them non-cognitive skills because we're not very imaginative. So we have cognitive skills and then we have non-cognitive skills, which I think if people have psychology backgrounds, they always cringe. Um, but, you know, and it's hard to measure, right? But so what we measure is how well, how much do students attend school? So the number of absences and also do they get involved in disciplinary problems? Okay, the second thing is I'm going to report to you on an intensive principal training program in the U.S., actually in the Chicago Public Schools. And then um, I think personally the most exciting part is to describe a comprehensive reform of principal evaluation and compensation, which was accompanied by a similar reform for teachers in the Dallas, Texas public schools. And I'm going to report some of the early evidence from that um, policy. And the, the thing I'm going to focus on is a related program to attract um, effective principals and teachers to very low achieving, high poverty schools. So it's tough to measure the effectiveness or, or the impact of a principal on a school because the principal doesn't actually have much contact with children. You know, some children do get in trouble. But in general, the principal's job is to make the school a better place for learning. And that really means to have better instruction in the classrooms and, you know, other opportunities during the day. Um, and when we think about what we want out of our schools, I don't think most of us think about higher test scores. I think most of us think we want our schools to educate children so, th so that they can do well in the workforce um, and in their personal lives and in their public lives when they're adults. And, you know, but it's difficult, right? Because if you're judging how good of a job a third grade is doing or a primary school is doing, you can't say, okay, we know who's the, you know, we'll, we'll record who were the educators this year in the third grade and then 20 years from now we'll come back in, you know, and we'll, we'll report back because that's not the way things work, right? So we, we want to focus on these outcomes we can measure simultaneously or at the end of the year and give feedback and make personnel decisions on. Um, but I think in the back of our minds, I don't th and I don't think it's done nearly enough, is we want to keep these longer term outcomes in the back of our mind, kind of keep our eyes on what's really important. Okay, so those immediate measures should be related to longer term outcomes. And I think that, you know, when, particularly when you think about standardized tests, there's a worry that standardized tests, that teachers can raise standardized tests by teaching kids very specific ways to do well on a standardized test. And I think that's why there's a real movement, and PISA has done this, to try to have tests that capture knowledge of important skills. Oops. Oh, oh good. Uh, so, you know, I said that about tests. High school graduation, you might think of, as would be a good outcome. The problem with high school graduation is in the U.S. there's a lot of mobility from, you know, from school to school. People are moving cities all the time. And so it's very hard to measure high school graduation and educators have become very good at manipulating the numbers. Um, and as I said yesterday, one of the, there was a famous case where someone would become basically equivalent to, to our Minister of Education for, under George W. Bush, who was from Houston, Texas, and he got caught having inflated the high school graduation numbers and he had to resign. Um, so we're gonna measure the behavioral skills on the basis mostly of absences, even though there are health influences certainly on absences, but you know, we think systematically there's lots of choices kids make in terms of whether, and families make in terms of whether kids come to school. And so we're gonna look at that. <laughs> there are disciplinary infractions. Um, and then something called grit. I don't know, do you know what grit is? Sort of determination. It's a big thing now in, in education in the US. And there's even thought of measuring it and putting in it our, our accountability systems that measure what schools do. And the person who kind of invented this term with relation to education is begging them not to do this. Um, because you can't, you know, if you put a measure of how we would measure whether students have grit, 
And then it becomes very simple for teachers to teach kids, well, you want to do these things so I get a good you know, rating on, on teaching grit. And yet that really won't be this, you know, this measure of how, you know, how persistent kids are when they fail, that they can come back and continue to work without getting upset. Um, I think the other important things other than test scores is how thoughtful people are, right? And that, that they can understand that somebody may disagree with you about you know, leaving Europe or about immigration, and you don't, uh, you know, you don't immediately, or treatment of trans transgender people, and you don't immediately just call them stupid and can't have any kind of discussion, which appears, you know, I don't know about the Czech Republic so much, but we were having this, uh, you know, this problem a lot. Um, so, we're going to focus on absences as the measure of, um, <coughs> of non-cognitive skill development. You know, so as I said, it's not so easy to measure what principals contribute to schools. Um, many aspects of the school is not under the control of the principal. The budget, the curriculum kids have to use, the books that they, that they use in their courses. Um, and it's also importantly, it's not by chance where families choose to live and where they send their kids to school. I mean, anyone in here with children knows that they thought a lot about where their kids are going to go to school. And you know, schools with, with lower socioeconomic status families um, and where learning on average tends to be lower, or here where perhaps more immigrant families and test scores would be lower, you don't want to attribute that to the educators because that's not fair. And not only is it not fair, but it makes it very difficult for those schools to attract. Those schools have a hard time attracting educators as is because the job is more difficult because the kids have, are less supported at home have lower incomes and then if you have an accountability system where you're rewarding or sanctioning educators on the basis of how well the kids do if you don't account for the fact that some kids come to school with more advantages than others then you're going to make it even more difficult for the schools in poor areas um, to be able to attract and retain good educators and that's something I'm going to come back to toward the end of the talk that's the most positive part of the talk, at the end, so it's good. Um, the other thing that's really hard about a principal is that the things that principals do the most, they probably, they in some ways have their largest effects after she leaves and is replaced by someone else. So you might, I've been department head for seven years now around, and during that time we've hired we've turned over about half the faculty. So by the time I'm done in three years, almost everyone who's been hired in the department will have been hired when I was the department head and, and in charge of hiring and then in charge of making decisions about who should get tenure and, and who's not able to stay. Now it's a, it's a joint effort, it's not just, I don't have total control, but I have a lot of influence. And so if you think about my effect on the department, if you were to measure the quality of education the quality of instruction in the department in my ninth year and then compare it to the quality of instruction two years after I'm gone, that's not much of a fair comparison between, uh, or that's not, wouldn't be a fair measure of my successor's effectiveness because my successor is stuck with many of the decisions that I previously made. You know, and it's very different than we talk about teaching. You teach, you give someone knowledge, and then the next year there's a new teacher and you didn't hire that teacher, you may have some influence over, over how productive she is if you're part of, you know, if you're working together in the school. But when we think about measuring the effectiveness of the subsequent teacher, we can control for, for the test scores at the end of the current year. And that's a pretty good control for my contribution along with previous contributions and that of the family. And then, the, and then how much test scores grow or how much other outcomes grow during that subsequent year is a pretty good measure of what that teacher did. So with principles, it's much harder. <coughs> okay, so what we do is we compare, we look at primary, we do this in two places in Chicago, the schools run from kindergarten to eighth grade that combine primary and, a, and lower secondary school. In Texas, there's a separate primary and separate lower secondary school. So that's usually grade K to five is primary and six, 
to eight is secondary, and we look at grades six to eight in Texas. And we compare two principals who were at the same school but at different times, and then we compare students who went to the thing about our middle schools or, or elementary schools is that kids from those schools go to high school with kids from lots of other schools. So we can co compare kids who went to the, high, the elementary school where I was teacher, you know, versus kids who went to the elementary school where Daniel was teacher, with the kids who went to the elementary school where Mirka was the teacher, and they were all in the high school together. And so by those comparisons, and we account for differences in the family, and we even account for differences in, in propensity to be absent earlier in your academic life, and your test scores at the start of the period, we can get a pretty good estimate of the contribution of the school under one principal versus another. And we're going to attribute that to the principal. Um, and yesterday we spent a lot of discussion on whether that attribution is reasonable. But I think there's a lot of supportive evidence of survey evidence of teachers and students and principals that show that, that educators, that schools under a principal that seem to do very well at fostering these outcomes, they get better survey responses when they ask the teachers how well they did or they ask the principals about their own skills and practices or even when they ask the students about the engagement of, and, and safety of the school. And I'm just gonna give you the summary because there's no nice pictures here because really what you're estimating is you're kind of getting a, you know, in some estimate of the contribution of each principal and we just care whether they differ a lot once we account for the noisiness of these, uh, of these measures. And we find that they do differ a lot, okay? That, that principals certainly affect test score growth but they also affect the elementary school, primary school principal, or, or, or <coughs> I'm sorry, lower secondary principal, also affects test scores and grades and absences when kids go to upper secondary school. So this is really what we want to see. We want to see that whatever the, the primary school principal is doing or lower secondary school principal is doing is carrying over and is long lasting knowledge that, that providing these skills to kids is lasting and helps them succeed at the next level. Whereas if you don't have a very good lower secondary school, um, that is gonna disadvantage you when you move on to the next level. Um, principles affect whether kids go to college and whether they persist in college. So that's at least three semesters or a year and a half. Um, and they also affect, in Texas we have data on whether kids are working and so one measure of, since many kids don't go to college, and we're worried a lot about the kids at the lower part of the distribution, we have a measure which looks at whether in the year after they should have graduated from high school, whether they're either working or employed. And in fact, we find a lot of differences in um, depending upon which principle you had and your probability of whether you're working or employed. What I do want to show you um, is that we found important differences in these principal effects on the basis of where kids started achievement-wise. And what's important is the state of Texas is a very large state. Um, some of you may have been there. It's got some big cities, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. It's got a lot of rural areas. It's got rural areas that are poor. It goes from to the west with cowboys and to the east where there are Cajuns, which is more like Louisiana. It's very southern. And so it's a very diverse state. And so we divide kids in Texas up, and there's high and low achievement kids in every school. So for each principal, we estimate what their effects are on the initially low achieving kids and what their effects are on the initial high achieving kids. And Chicago is a single big city. It's where I was born and raised in Chicago. And I worked outside of Chicago for many years, but I came back seven years ago. Um, but it's very high poverty in the Chicago public schools. And I think, you know, roughly 80 or 85 percent of the, the kids are classified as being poor. And um, we have racial, you know, we have a lot of racial segregation. It's actually, it gets, it's a, it gets a lot of bad news around the world, starting with Al Capone, right? You know, and the mafia. 
And there's some violence in Chicago today, but if you were to visit Chicago, and you know, we're in the center of the city, you would never know it. So the violence tends to be a little bit outside this, the city in the very poor, particularly poor black neighborhoods. So it's really a range of circumstances to educate kids. And so the low achievement kids in Chicago are, are much more low achievement than the low achievement kids in Texas. Okay. Now what these are, the importance of these numbers is to look the stars say the number is meaningful, it's not just by chance. And the sign, whether it's positive or negative, tells you what's imp what, what we're really trying to get at here is the correlation or association between a principal's effects on test scores and whether kids are absent in the subsequent years, and that principal's effects on post-secondary schooling. So whether you go to college and persistent college, and whether you're working or in college. And so, <coughs> these are low achievement kids in Texas. And I think that one of the things that's important here is that when you see that learning that the principals who raise you know, mathematics knowledge on standardized tests in math, but particularly in reading, those are the same principles where the kids are more likely to attend college, remain in college, and also um, are either employed or, or working in the period right after high school, though that result is a little bit weaker. And what's also true here is that a, is that a middle school principal or a lower secondary school principal whose kids were less likely to be absent when they were in upper secondary school those principals um, also educate kids who are more likely to attend college, persistent college, and, and be doing something productive after high school. And I think what this, is, what this is showing is that it's the teaching and the acquisition of both cognitive skills, you know, better math and reading skills, but also better behavioral skills, kind of showing up for school. But each of those types of skills um, is positively related to your, you know, to your academic attainment after you leave upper secondary school, and <coughs> whether you work or not. And in Chicago, what's interesting is it really holds more for higher achieving kids. But in many ways, there's a lot of overlap between the higher achieving kids in Chicago and the lower part of the distribution in Texas, because the lower is much is not as low in Texas. And the higher part of the Chicago distribution is not as high as the upper part of the Texas distribution. So again, um, it's, both, it's both cognitive skills, particularly in mathematics, and non-cognitive skills uh, measured by, you know, by attendance at school. The effects principles have on those things are highly correlated with the effects principles are having on, on uh, college attendance and persistence in college. And we don't have measures of employment for Chicago. Does anyone have any quick clarifying questions? Because I want to make sure that you can follow. OK. Yes? So there is a difference between Chicago and Texas in reading skills. Do you in some way? So you know, I, I think these are, these are tricky, right? Because it's the difference in the effects, the primary, you know, the elementary school principal in Chicago has, and the elementary school in Chicago runs from kindergarten to eighth grade. The effect that that principal has on reading um, and, and how that's associated with the effect that she has on these college outcomes. And it is stronger for reading in Chicago than it is, uh, I'm sorry, it's stronger in, Chica in Texas than it is in Chicago. I don't have an explanation for, you know, for why. I would, to be honest, I might have thought it would have been the opposite because reading is the kind of skill that's taught earlier in life. Now, part of that may be because the, one of the tricky things about Chicago is this principal may have had these children starting in kindergarten and we only picked them up in fourth grade so that we can account for their third grade reading scores. So it's very possible that that the principals in Chicago had already kind of made their contribution to reading earlier in their, in their careers. A general finding in research on schools is that educators have a much bigger effect on mathematics 
than in reading. But a more recent finding on, on these longer term outcomes is reading skills are actually as or more important in persistence in schooling. And that's actually what you see in, you know, in Texas. So I don't, I don't probably have a satisfactory answer. And you know, the, the ones in Chicago are very not precise, they're not really precisely estimated. So with regard to <coughs> particularly college persistence, statistically they're probably not different, though we haven't tested that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I know you're so polite if this were the room of just economists. You know, they, they wouldn't be so polite. Um, <laughs> So let me summarize, but I really want to get, I think, what you'll find more interesting. Um, and this is just by way of background to show that principles are important, that there's a lot of differences between, you know, if you went to, I think my father-in-law went to school somewhere in Smichov, some, you know, nice upper secondary gymnasium. Um, he commuted there from Rudna. And, you know, he talks to me, he talked to me about it a lot. And, the key thing is that if you went to that school during a period, you know, let's say, I don't know when he went sometime during the 50s, and then you went to school, that school, you know, 10 years later under a different head of the school, that you'd be getting a different education. Okay? It still may be a very good school, but, you know, there, there would be significant differences because the school leader is important. Um, all right, so let's talk about policy. So, we've talked already about accountability a little bit. Maybe, maybe some of you know the United States has a major accountability system where we measure outcomes, student outcomes in schools, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We've talked about more stringent qualifications. Um, the alignment of incentives with achievement, I'm going to talk about the Dallas Public Schools, and my presentation will have the, the URLs of where to find these descriptions on the, uh, on the Dallas Independent School District website. I think another exciting school district in the U.S. is the Washington, D.C. public schools, which has historically been very poor. You know, it's, it's striking to me that we have our, the capital of our country and parts of the city um, are higher income, but a large part of the city is one of the poorest places in the United States. And so there's been a lot of work done to try to improve those schools. And in fact, I think this, the, the efforts there have been quite promising. Um, and there's, there's work to improve preparation programs. And we have charter schools in the US which are publicly funded and, um, but, but privately operated by, <coughs> by for-profit or in most cases not-for-profit organizations. They're public schools but the management is contracted out. Um, KIPP is one of the major charter school organizations in the country. They're very well funded, and they use these leader, they, they emphasize leadership, and they spend a lot of money training their leaders. And they use what's kind of the, the um, physician model. I don't know about how physicians are, are, I know, I mean, my wife's cousins, a couple are physicians, but I don't really know much about training here. But in the U.S., you go, to med you go to undergraduate for four years, and then you go to medical school for four years, and then you have a residency afterwards. You know, where you're basically, you're watching, you're actually, you're doing a lot of the medicine yourself too, but a lot of that is you're, you know, you're a resident, you're watching the experienced doctors do their work. So KIPP has this residency program where they take someone they'd like to be a leader of a school, and for six months, they're being paid, but they're not really doing anything at the school other than observing the principal and working with the principal. And the Chicago public schools have taken on the same program. Now, the, the traditional way for someone to become a school principal is that typically a teacher, and it's no longer just physical education teachers, never was only, but it was you know, often, um, would become an assistant principal so it would be an administrator in the building who worked for the principal, and depending upon the size of the school, there may be one or more than one. And after some years as, as an assistant principal, if that person wanted to be a principal, then they would progress to a job as a principal. And the concern is that when you're an assistant principal and you're keeping track of the lunchroom and the kids who are getting kicked out of their classes and the playground where some boy got a bloody nose, or you know, there's so much happens during the day in a school 
that the assistant principal didn't really have time to learn about good skills from principals. I, I find that kind of hard to, to believe. <laughs> I think people have their eyes open. I think what's more compelling is that if you don't think many principals are very good, and people are assistant principals working for someone who's not all that good, then there's no reason to think they're going to they're going to accumulate good skills and, and ideas about running schools. So this residency program, one of the main ideas is they put these residents in schools with people who are believed to be some of the better principals in the system. So this is what we're going to study is Chicago. So there's, there's the objective of the residency program is to increase the supply of effective principals through a training program that incorporates this residency. Um, and not only, you can think of two groups of people. One group who, wanted, who always wanted to be a principal and was going to be an assistant principal, maybe already is an assistant principal, and the residency is meant to give them better skills. The other group of people are people who weren't going to become school principals, but the residency program is more professional and maybe more attractive to them. And so maybe these people are now more willing to, to become a principal. So you can think about the residency program maybe as changing the, the, the sort of, I don't like to use the word quality, but sort of the entering skills of people considering jobs as a principal and also providing more skills as, as they go through the program. Well, we can't separate whether the program itself gives, you know, helps people become better principals or whether the program would attract better principals into the, into the uh, system. So this residency program in Chicago, the selection process was, is rigorous. You have to have classroom and leadership experience. Um, local schools of teacher and administrative preparation programs, as well as national ones, um, are partners with the school district. So students get a degree from those programs, you know, their, their administrator degree, and then they, you know, they also do the residency. You get mentoring from a high-performing principal, and it's an expensive program because the Chicago Public School District is paying people a salary while they're in the program and they have no formal job responsibilities. So if you imagine that I was the assistant principal or at a school, and then I became a resident, the district would have to replace me with another assistant principal, <coughs> and they would pay me my, my salary. And it's $80,000 a year, um, or my current salary, whichever one is higher. So this is an expensive program for the district. So the benefits to the district of this program are likely to be larger. The larger is the impact on principal effectiveness. The longer a participant serves as a principal, right? You can give someone all this training and then they only serve as a principal for a couple of years and then they leave the schools. So there's, it's not very valuable for the schools. The problem is more serious in a place in an individual district like Chicago than it would be for a country like the Czech Republic because you can get trained in Chicago and then you can move to some you know, nice fancy suburb nearby who might pay you more money to work as a principal. So they require residents to sign an agreement that if they don't remain in the schools for a certain number of years, they have to pay the money back. I don't know whether they would enforce it. Um, and the more rapid the transition to becoming a principal. So you give someone training as a resident, then if they can't get jobs as a principal, they can't use those skills and it's not likely to benefit the district very much. Okay, so what you can see, this is three years after someone has been a resident. And <coughs> the blue bar tells you that about half of the people who finished residencies had become principals. And that's pretty, in many ways, discouraging, right? Because you spend all this money training people and even three years after they finish with the program, only half have become residents. Most of them are still assistant principals. And the hiring is a little complicated in Chicago because schools have control over who they hire or the governing body of each school. So the district trains these residents and they can't put them into schools, okay? Now what's true is not many of them have left the district. So it's, they don't have that problem, but there is a real problem that 
not enough of them have become principals because the skills you learn as a resident are going to deteriorate the longer you don't put them in practice and you're going to be more influenced by the more recent um, experiences in your career. <coughs> in Chicago, residents typically are placed into the lower performing schools, lower achievement schools, and in a way that's why the program was put in place in the first place, to raise the quality of education for disadvantaged children. Um, so you can't compare the test scores in a school led by a resident versus the test scores in a school led by a principal who didn't go through the residency program because the residents are being hired in lower achievement schools. So to account for that, I'm just going to show you the trends of in the achievement in the period leading up to the hiring of the new principal and then show you how the trends change in schools led by a resident on average versus <laughs> the trends changing in schools led by a non-resident who was hired in a similar period. And the left side is mathematics and the right side is reading and, and the lines represent average achievement. If you look at the left diagram, it starts off seven years before the new principal is hired, six years, five, four, three, two, one, and for these schools that were getting new principals, achievement was going down a bit. And those are intense of a standard deviation of test scores. And the schools where the non-resident took a job, you know, that line is above. That's the upper line versus the school the resident took a job. But I think what's really striking, and the school the resident took a job had a big drop in the year the resident took the job. So zero is the first year of the resident, so the resident had a real hard time, but doesn't really improve later. And if you look at reading on the right-hand side, the same thing. So even, you know, even in the second year, which is one, or the third year, which is two, or the fourth year, which is three, you don't see a significant closing of the gap in achievement between schools that hired a non-resident and those that hired a resident. So there's really little evidence that you know, this large expenditure you know, is paying off in terms of being able to close the gap in school quality and, and raise school quality. Does anyone have any questions about the meaning of the diagram? Okay, so that's kind of what I, and, and I think the large financial investment by, might be more useful if used in other ways, and I kind of lead in by saying such a support for evaluation and compensation reform. So, the other thing I want to talk about is eva educator pay and evaluation prior to the accountability reforms, because I'm going to talk to you about a, a comprehensive system um, that's in, in the Dallas Public Schools. <coughs> so in the US, salaries typically are set at the district level, and they have what's called a salary scale. So each year of experience would typically raise your salary, though it may, it may flatten out at a certain point. And if you want to have a higher salary, you would typ typically want to get an advanced degree, a master's degree, or even a PhD. And, and there's a large body of evidence that shows that teachers who have a master's degree don't outperform teachers who just have a bachelor's degree. And I think the you know, economists have sort of taken this finding, and it's one of the findings on which there was very little debate, and said it's not so surprising. Because when you have a system that's set up where all you need is a master's degree to get higher pay, and there you are, you're teaching already, maybe you have a kid, life is busy, what do you do? You get the easiest masters you can get. And there's an industry of now online programs and you know, programs that are not very demanding where teachers get a master's degree and the programs make money. And so it may be that under a different system, additional education would, could, would help you become a more effective teacher. But the incentives of the system are really to get the easiest degree. Okay, so salary dependent on experience and academic degree. And evaluations <coughs> of teachers were common. Most teachers got them, but almost everybody got a positive evaluation. And 
you know, this is a period when people were very unhappy about, you know, the quality of schooling. And why did everybody get a positive evaluation? Well, anyone who's a supervisor knows you, when you give people negative evaluations, you know, your life becomes a little unpleasant, right? They're unhappy. You have to have an unhappy interaction. They may start saying bad things about you to their colleagues. And it's a lot easier just to say that they're doing a fine job. Um, and that's particularly the case if they have job security, right? So if people have tenure and you know, aren't going to leave the school even if they're doing a poor job, then you're going to let someone know they're not doing a very good job, that person's going to be grumpy, and they're just going to continue working. And they don't have much of an incentive to improve because um, you know, their incentive to improve would have to be intrinsic, inside, and they, they obviously it wasn't strong enough to get them to improve before, and now that they're mad at you for treating them badly, they're probably not going to improve anyway. Um, and there was little incentive for administrators to have those difficult discussions, because their livelihood, their salaries, you know, their um, job security wasn't really dependent very much on how well the kids performed, you know, how much learning went out in the school. So you had a system which was stagnant. Okay, so it's very easy to avoid things that are difficult and managing any, any organization, you know, is difficult. And there are difficult parts to it that people don't, you know, don't enjoy. <coughs> so the United States put in a test score based accountability system when George W. Bush was president, so I think it was 1992 when the system was adopted, or 93. Um, the states had already been doing this on their own. Not 1992, I'm sorry, 2002. So when, because it was Clinton was president in 1992, and during the Clinton's presidency, states were experimenting with these kinds of systems. In fact, the data we have from Texas, which was from the early 90s, came from such a system being put in place in Texas during that period. And the evidence of what happened in those states was used to support the passage of a national, of national legislation that put in the federal No Child Left Behind reform, NCLB, that has recently been replaced by another one which is a little bit less strict. Um, and each school was rated largely on the basis of test scores. Um, and not much else, and really the average test scores in the school, what they did do was you got, they used the average test scores of all the kids and then for each group. So if you had low income students, they would have the average for low income kids, black students for black kids, Hispanic students for Hispanic kids, and the school was rated and it's no child left behind, so the rating of the school depended upon the, the demographic group that scored the lowest. That determined the rating. There were, other, there were things put in place to try to make it um, not so punitive for schools that had a lot of um, initially low achieving kids who came from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, but this was the system and schools could be sanctioned for low scores. And the focus on test scores rather than test score growth and other measures and having a, a more holistic system that measured more about what educators were doing was really <coughs> problematic. I think it, it was promising and a good first step that, that we started measuring um, outcomes in schools rather than just sort of looked at the characteristics, the spending levels and things. But No Child Left Behind didn't do it very well. And I would say that the fixes that were made, the new legislation, didn't necessarily improve it. Um, but with that time, only time will tell. So Dallas had a new superintendent who had worked in Colorado. He was a former Air Force person. He was in a kind of extraordinary guy. He was a great admirer of Eric Hanischek and economist's work on um, on education. He was a great believer in incentives and that the focus had to be on the children and he was totally apolitical. So he was really driven to put in his system and enact it and if people were unhappy with it, that's just the way it went. 
And so um, he put this system in place. It was a comprehensive evaluation system that combined information from supervisor observations. So teachers were observed a number of times during the year. Principals were observed by the school superintendent or the superintendent's assistants a number of times during the year. And everyone got a performance, this was called a performance evaluation. Some of you may know, I think, I think they may use something like the Danielson rubric in Dallas for teachers. There are a number of different rubrics which measure different aspects of educators' um, jobs. That was one element of the evaluation. The second element was surveys. For teachers, it was of students. And for principals, it was of families, where families would give survey responses to questions about the educator. And, and the responses would determine, again, a given number of points that would go into the, the educator's score. The third part had to do with test scores, which were not only the state standardized scores, but the city of Dallas developed a number of assessments so that the art teacher was assessed, the music teacher was assessed, very young kids were assessed, because the states, the state tests are mostly in, in language arts and mathematics and they cover grades three through eight, you know, for uh, primary and lower secondary school. And um, the ratings category are determined by the score. So you add them up to get an evaluation score. It's Important, some teachers, you can't, if you teach kindergarten, they don't ask the kids to answer surveys about the teacher. And um, some subjects didn't have assessments. So, as I'll tell you in a minute, the weights placed on the observational component, the, t the student achievement component, and the survey component may differ across teachers. Um, no educator received the salary duties in the early years of the program. Um, if a new teacher was rated really highly, they couldn't get the top couple salary categories. They could get the high rating, but their salary would remain lower. The third thing that I should add that's not in here is they created a very strict distribution of the fraction of teachers would be in the top category, second category, third category, and the bottom categories. Because they were worried about this problem that educators would all receive very high evaluation scores. And so he built into the system a distribution to make sure that, you know, it's sort of like when you curve grades in a class. If the median grade is going to be a C plus or a B minus, that's just the way it is. Half the students are going to get lower. They did the same thing here. <coughs> okay. Um, the objectives were to provide comprehensive information on job performance to be used in professional development, um, provide fair and accurate ratings of job performance to be used in compensation and employment decisions, and to raise the quality of instruction and leadership. If you get a lot of information, um, the mentoring and support you receive, the feedback you receive is going to be better. Um, particularly when that information is linked with the test scores of your students. So it's one thing for me as a principal to say, oh, you should have done X, Y, and Z to a teacher who did very well. It carries less weight than if I say, you know, if we look at the test scores of the kids in your class, they're really not learning this element of mathematics very well. You really need to work on this. And here's, here's what I observed, and here's some of the things I think you need to do. Um, the incentives are supposed to raise effort, because now the higher your evaluation score, the more money you're going to make, the more prestige you have by having a higher rating. Um, and you hope that because performance and, and how effective you are as an educator is more closely linked with your compensation, with your salary, that this is going to attract more effective educators into the profession and it's going to discourage less effective educators from entering and remaining. It is making being an educator in Dallas more risky in terms of your salary. And that riskiness probably needs to be compensated by an average somewhat higher level of salary. And they did that as well. So I, I just outlined the key features. I think that, that Daniel's gonna post the presentation, so I put the URL in there to describe it. Student achievement component depends upon results relative to similar <coughs> schools, so you're not just comparing apples and oranges. Um, 
It measures really the effect on test score growth, essentially, not exactly. And the district assessments are developed for all subjects and grades. Super observations have a rubric. The family surveys contribute to the score. Now, one of the most important things, which I thought is so clever, is that principals observe teachers and they give ratings to teachers. And one of the things is that as a principal, if you're giving high ratings to teachers whose students do very poorly on tests, that's showing a misalignment between your observational evaluation and how well the teachers are doing to foster learning. You, your score is deducted, points are deducted from your score. Your score is lowered. And so you have an incentive to to be accurate when you're evaluating your personnel, your teachers, and I think. Now, one of the things we just learned when we met with the district is they think that's slipping a little bit. That these principals have learned that the small penalty they pay for being a little bit inaccurate may be compensated by the fact that if they give teachers slightly better evaluations, the teachers may be a little bit happier and more likely to stay in the school so they won't have to deal with turnover, as long as the teachers aren't too bad. So it's kind of interesting that the principals see this trade-off um, and are acting on it. But I think they're acting on it, taking into consideration how it's going to affect the quality of instruction in the school. The Teacher Ex Excellence Initiative, which is the component of this for teachers, they also have achievement components. You get the major part of your achievement score is determined by how your students do, unless you don't have tested students in your classroom. But you're also influenced by, um, your score is also influenced by the average in the school as a whole. So that there is, again, built in this system, you know, um, incentives <coughs> for the educators to cooperate with one another. There's always a worry if you have these systems that pit one teacher against the other, even though they really don't, um, that it'll discourage cooperation. So they actually make it clear to the educators that how well the school does as a whole matters for everybody. Okay, and there's student surveys. And again, the weights given to the three components for teachers depends upon you know, whether you have kids old enough to write uh, responses and whether there are assessments uh, for the subject you're teaching. Now this has been in place only a couple of years and we're waiting for a couple of years of data. So I didn't bring you any of the preliminary results. I think it's too soon because this is a big, this is a huge reform that probably had an initial negative shock. And then the question is over time, or the, is the quality of education getting better? The preliminary look is that test scores in Dallas are improving relative to the rest of the state, improving quite a bit. Um, and, it, and there was evidence that teachers with lower ratings were more likely to leave the Dallas public schools. But it's going to be a few more, you know, this year where we have two additional years of data where we're really gonna, gonna try to do a comprehensive evaluation. One of the things about the Dallas system is that low rated teachers are not kicked out. Now in Washington DC, that's not the case. That if you get a very low rating, you can be, you know, you're, you can be basically uh, fired. If you get a slightly higher rating, you can be put on pro academic probation basically. And if you get a low rating in the subsequent year again, then you can lose your job. So Washington does have that element as part of their system. Dallas doesn't. But of course, you know, being very low rated for a teacher, it's it's um, certainly discouraging and, and probably induces some people to leave. And school principals, you know, probably also now having greater incentive to, you know, to have a higher quality of instruction, similarly, um, are going to be trying to guide ineffective teachers out. Okay. So the part that, that I'm going to end with, okay, is this. Um, when they put this system in place, everyone has always known that it's hard to attract teachers and educators to low achievement schools. And, you know, perhaps in the Czech Republic, it might be hard to attract an educator to schools with a large Roma population. Or in the U.S., there's always been concern that it'd be hard to attract teachers to schools with predominantly um, African-American neighborhoods. So, that's always been a worry. And then when you add a system of accountability, which is linking pay to how well the students do, that could have made it even worse. And in fact, when the systems were first put in place, 
it looked like um, educators were departing schools that had <coughs> low achievement and high and higher levels of poverty. And so that was a real concern. And what the district decided to do um, was, to, was to take radical <coughs> action to attract effective educators into those very low achievement schools that were losing teachers and principals. Okay? And it's not only the achievement level of the kids, but I think educators are worried a lot about who their peers are going to be. Who's the principal? How, you know, how effective and how, you know, how dedicated are the people who you're going to be working with? And if a low achievement school probably didn't have a very good principal and probably had teachers who had been there a while or, or, or were churning new teachers every year and the main goal of teachers was to get into a better school for many of them. So the district response was, and this has never, I think, never been done in the US before, I'm not sure anywhere in the world, was to provide additional pay to effective educators willing to work in the seven schools classified as very um, low performing. They took the principals out of those schools and they put in seven new principals who had been rated as, as effective in the previous year. It was called the Academic Excellence Initiative. <coughs> um, and the educators were offered large salary supplements to move to one of these seven A schools. Salary increases of up to 8,000 per year for teachers and 12,000 per year for principals. It's on the order of 15% of pay. Um, and the, sep the value of the supplement depended upon how highly you were rated in the previous year, but nobody related below effective could get a supplement. And um, there were four categories of schools. Seven low achievement schools were put into this program. 18 schools that were close, they were also very low achieving, were, were designated as kind of near ACE. There were 53 schools that were classified as poor, you know, as sort of higher poverty schools, and the remaining 165 schools. And so I want to show you, you can look at the share of effective principles. There's the ACE schools, and focus on the ACE and the near ACE schools. Um, the ACE schools, the blue bar is 2014-15 academic year before the program. The red bar is 2015-16 after the program. There were no effective principals in the A schools in 2014-15, and 70% had been rated effective in 15-16. In terms of teachers, 30% of the teachers in the A school had an effective rating. And effective doesn't mean great. 60% of educators get rated effective or above. So think of it, in the A school, they were drawing 70% of their teachers from the lowest 40% of the distribution. After the reform, it was 70%. Um, and so ACE went from a school system that had the lowest, by far, percentage of effective educators to now the one with the highest percentage. And here's the trends in math scores. So the blue line are the ACE schools. This is the average math score. And what you can see is the A schools are way below the other schools. <coughs> um, and it's not temporary. They've been below the whole period. In fact, the near A schools have been declining in achievement more. But you go from 2015 to 2016, and the, and the closing of the gap between the A schools and the other schools is remarkable. Just one year, and the kids didn't change. If anything, on average, the kids were more poor and lower achieving in the last year after the reform than in the previous year. And it's kind of remarkable that achievement in the A schools actually went above the achievement in the, near, in the next lower category of schools and significantly closed the gap of the achievement in the other schools. The findings for reading, the pattern is the same. There had also been a lot of improvement in the near A schools. Um, math, I think, is really the subject where it's most difficult to attract skilled teachers. And so, um, I think these results are really striking. There's a lot of people who talk about, you know, it takes a village is the expression in the U.S., or these kids are so poor and disadvantaged, they really, it's very hard for us to do anything. But I think you took the seven lowest achievement <coughs> schools in, um, in the city, they really put a lot of money into it and moved experienced, 
you know, effective educators in as a group and created a, a school of effective educators and achievement really rose in the ACE schools. So ACE has been remarkably successful at raising the quality of instruction and achievement in low performing schools. It kind of creates a negative cycle. You're in a low achieving schools, it's hard to attract and retain good teachers, there's lots of turnover of teachers, people who remain there for a long time are often not very good. And you know, this can go on indefinitely. Um, when we think of the sources of improvement, there were more effective principals and teachers individually, but also as a group. And it's hard to disentangle them. Um, and it's costly to, have, to allow this to happen to a school, because as you can see here, they had to really make a large effort with a lot of money to turn this school around. So summing up, it's important to improve the effectiveness of school leaders. They affect the acquisition of cognitive and behavioral non-cognitive skills. And they're important determinants of educational attainment, future employment and earnings, and social outcomes. We had hoped to get data on arrests and criminal behavior, because particularly with concerns about the lower, you know, the really lower part of the achievement distribution, the highest, the poorest kids, but we weren't able to do so yet. Um, Evidence suggests it's difficult to raise effectiveness through investments in training programs or regulations. Um, many program participants did not become principals, and a number who do will likely leave the public school after a short period, and there's little evidence that they were more effective while they were in the school. Um, other evidence suggests that stricter licensing requirements are unlikely to significantly raise the quality of school leaders or teachers. Um, Comprehensive evaluation and compensation reform are really promising. Management is something you learn by doing and by observing others. You know, I think when you're a teacher or when you're working anywhere, you sort of observe the way the department head or manager works and you, you know, you think about one, whether you'd like to do it, and two, the things that you like about what they do, that which you don't like. And being an assistant principal seems like perhaps the best place to learn. Um, the comprehensive evaluation uh, reform are promising. They provide information and performance which can support professional development, fair and comprehensive information for decisions about salary and employment. Um, it likely strengthens the incentives to raise the quality of instruction, um, attract and retain more effective educators. The early evidence on Dallas and Washington, D.C. is quite promising. Um, the outcome measures should be related to longer term academic labor market and social success. And I think one of the other things it does when you have a system like this is it provides a lot of information to the public. And it's really important, I mean, you know, you think of the difference between the poor, poor people who don't have very educated parents or immigrants who aren't used to the system and higher upper middle class people who feel very comfortable advocating for their kids. That it really can empower people to provide this kind of information about how their schools are doing relative to other schools who are teaching similar kids and relative to schools that are teaching um, the rest of the population. Um, it improves transparency. It can place pressure on those responsible for schools, including education ministers and politicians at all levels to raise the quality of instruction. And it may be most important for lower SES families. That's it.